ABC News, read by Mark Adenor. State and Territory leaders want an urgent meeting with the Prime Minister as they deal with the prospect of Commonwealth budget cuts. The federal government plans to slash $80 billion from schools and hospitals over the next 10 years, arguing the state should take more responsibility for funding those services. State and Territory leaders, with the exception of the West Australian Premier, have been meeting in Sydney to come up with a plan to address their concerns. The ABC's been told they want to fast-track talks on Commonwealth state relations and have a meeting with the Prime Minister before July the 1st. The federal opposition leader Bill Shorten says the budget has given Labor its voice back. The party's vowing to block several key savings measures, including the $7 co-payment on all doctor visits. It describes the measure as an attack on Medicare. Speaking at the Victorian Labor conference, Mr Shorten says the opposition won't support anything that makes it harder to get medical help. This budget of the Abbott government, it has surely defined not only the Liberal Party of Australia... This budget, this terrible first budget of the Abbott government, it has defined the Labor Party. Friends, the Labor Party nationally has its voice back. Thousands of protesters have gathered at South Australia's Parliament House to protest against the federal budget. Chris McLaughlin reports. About 5,000 people took part in the March in May demonstration through Adelaide City Centre's State Parliament. They condemned all aspects of the budget, from pension cuts to changes in university charges and unemployment benefits outlined in the budget. The state government says the cuts are being felt in South Australia already, with 20,000 training and apprenticeship positions to be lost from July the 1st. Chris McLaughlin, ABC News, Adelaide. Investigations are continuing into the death of a 40-year-old New South Wales man who died in a boating accident in Fiji. Tamina Ansari reports. The man was on holiday with his family when he was killed after two boats collided near a resort island. Fijian police say he was returning from a fishing trip with four other men when they were hit by another boat travelling at high speed. The injured men were taken to the nearby resort medical centre where the 40-year-old died of his injuries. Fijian police say collisions involving tourist boats are rare and the company operating the boat had never been involved in an accident. Australian consular officials are providing assistance to the dead man's family. The man was staying at Manor Island Resort with his wife and children. More than 700,000 Australians and New Zealanders travel to the country each year. A jet ski rider who went missing yesterday in central Queensland has been found dead. Police say the 53-year-old disappeared jet skiing in Wild Cattle Creek at Tannum Sands about two o'clock yesterday afternoon. The Coast Guard Water Police and a rescue helicopter looked for the man, but he was found dead in thick mangroves about one o'clock this morning. Fresh protests have broken out in several major cities in Turkey over the country's worst mining accident. Peter Simpson reports. Turkey has called a halt to the Soma mine rescue operation after two more bodies were found, raising the death toll to 301. The bodies of all miners trapped after the mine collapsed are now thought to have been recovered. While inadequate safety measures have been blamed for the disaster, company officials have denied they were negligent. Several hundred people marched through the centre of the western city of Izmir, chanting slogans against Against the government. Protesters also clashed with police near Soma. More than 30 people, including several lawyers, are reported to have been arrested. Police are appealing for witnesses to come forward after a shooting which left one man dead and another injured in Melbourne's north. Police were called to a house in Ploughman Court, Epping, about 11 o'clock last night. It's believed a number of attackers ran away from the scene. Detective Senior Sergeant Shane O'Connell says anyone with information should contact police. It's a fairly horrendous incident uh, to have more than one person attend uh, an address at this late hour in a residential neighbourhood. Uh, it's of great concern to us uh, and it is for that reason that we seek assistance from the public. South Australian police are investigating a fire at a Warradale house which led them to a large amount of cannabis inside. The blaze started on the front porch of the Hobart Avenue house at about a quarter past two this morning and was quickly put out. To the national weather, Sydney partly cloudy, currently 23 degrees. Melbourne mostly cloudy, it's 21. Brisbane a possible shower, 23 degrees. In Perth, a shower or two, 21 at the moment. Adelaide, partly cloudy, currently 24 degrees. In Hobart, partly cloudy, 18. Canberra, cloudy, it's 18. And Darwin, mostly sunny, 32 degrees. ABC News. Double J. One more time. The ABC's new music radio station is ready for your ears. 
Weekdays, join Mick Warhurst, playing you the music you've loved and the music we reckon you're going to love. Double J. J. On your mobile via the ABC radio app, online at doublej.net.au, or look for Double J on your digital radio or TV. Grandstand AFL. Grandstand AFL. Live and commercial free. You're with Grandstand. During the week, football lost one of its most iconic and well-loved people in Tommy Hafey, who lost his battle with cancer at age 82. Tommy's love of football, people and a healthy lifestyle is legendary. Today, the day before his funeral service at his beloved MCG, we paid tribute to his contribution to the game we love by reliving some of the moments that define him with some of the people who were there. Today we say, Vale, Tom Hafey. He was born and bred in Richmond. He was a back pocket battler who rose on to become a super coach. There's Hafey now being shouldered high by his players. An amazing legacy of this football club. He is, um, in every sense of the word, a, a true immortal. If we won, uh, we won for Tommy. If we lost, we were so disappointed that we'd let him down. He needs to be remembered as somebody who was a very, very special person. We've been privileged to know him and to know that family, and I hope they understand in his passing what a magnificent person he's been for the game, but what a magnificent contributor to what I call the football family. Tommy had great faith in his players, and I think that sort of gives players a lot of confidence. The four premiership points are the most important thing. So you're hoping, hoping, hoping that you're going to get away to a good start. The word love is not too strong a word, because that's pretty much what Tommy and Gina and his players was a real genuine affection for his players and vice versa. We're fitter than the rest. That was the way he was, that was what he demanded. Now, some found him too tough because he was demanding in terms of physical preparation. But those who took to the Tommy doctrine loved him, and I don't use the word lightly, and loved him to this very day. Love the way he lived his life, I love the messages he gave, not just to young footballers or Richmond players, but uh, in particular just the work he did with schools and um, what he encouraged in life. If football was to be, say, cut out because of insurance problems, we would be building second and third stories on every channel in Australia. You realise that? That's how important it is. Uh, in the role that we serve the game here, if not for people like Tom Hafey, it would be impossible to actually try and grow our game. His love for the game and love for physical fitness and love for all of those sorts of things certainly is his legacy. That made him incredibly relatable throughout Australia, through small towns, communities, through the country, in prisons, in schools, in hospitals, sporting clubs around the country. He always had that great warmth, that genuine interest in people and sincerity and, uh, and I think people really bonded. He was an amazing man. Whenever you ask Tommy, how are you going? It's um, sensational and I'm getting better. So I think that was his outlook on life. He's an immortal, so in that respect he'll live on, but his legacy at our club is enormous. Uh, not, not, not just his coaching and his incredible success, but the way he coached, the person he was, and the way he influenced and touched and affected so many people. There's no race colour creed in football and apple club. There's no room for the rich or for poor in football and apple club. Doesn't matter what school you went to, what car you drive, or how big a house you live in. I played for Tom Hafey, uh, and Tom Hafey was the Richmond Football Club, and I think there was a lot of other players that felt exactly the same. When you get down to the ground, everybody is an equal. Because um, he was one of us. Hi, I'm Drew Morfitt, and in the next hour, we're, we're going to relive the life of Tom Afey, tell a few stories with a few people who were involved with him. Uh, in the studio, we have some people here, and hopefully on the phone, we'll get a few more, and we'll hear some words from Tom himself from an interview done by Kevin Bartlett's son, Rhett, in his lounge room uh, a few years ago, just talking about life and football. In the studio, Ian Octa Wilson, who was president of the Tigers in those golden years when Tommy won four premierships. Welcome, Octa. Thanks, Drew. Fantastic to see you here. Kevin Morris, who played in the 73 and 74 premierships. Then you went to Collingwood and you copped him again. I did. A glutton for punishment, Drew. <laughs> and Gareth Andrews, who did the swap with Rex Hunt just in time for you to get to Richmond and play on that 74 flag. 16 weeks after I swapped. And is it true that you actually trained with the Cats on a Thursday night and you were selected for Richmond that following Saturday? No, no. I found out on uh, Monday. Told by the 
told by the Tigers that I was playing with them next Saturday, not by Geelong, who I'd played with for the previous nine years. That's and uh, then I was told that, I was told that, uh, I said, I'll oh, give me a day or two to answer it. And they said, no, no way, this is GR. Because as I found out, uh, Alf Brown already had the story. He was going to print it the next. He'd written the story for the next yeah. day. So Rex had played his flags with Richmond. Off yeah. he went to Geelong and played no more. But you got to Richmond just in time. To and play he reckons one. he still reckons I've got his premiership trophy, <laughs> and he's not getting it back. Now also we have here Swan Mackay, who played four premierships with Carlton. And you might have inspired Richmond's flags in 73, 74 by caning them in 72 at the MCG. And, of course, you spent many years around the grounds with Tommy on grandstand. Go on, just one. Good afternoon, Drew. Yes, it's, uh, it's a sad day. Well, it was when Tommy died because um, I got to know him perhaps uh, quite, a, quite a lot differently than a lot of others. Um, it was fantastic. We had the best seat in the house and we watched footy all day. And when we were off air, we uh, talked as much as we did on air, in fact, more. And uh, I really got to know Tommy really well. And uh, I became... Strangely enough, probably played in uh, pre three premierships against sides he coached, uh, but I think he in invited me into the Richmond family. He used to ring ring us every on uh, on every uh, Christmas Eve or just before Christmas. I wanted to know uh, how you're going and um, you know how your wife was going, your kids were going. He knew your wife's name, your kids' name. He was just a sensational guy, and uh, we'll really miss him. That's amazing. Okta, can you tell us how it started? Uh, three premierships he coached with Shepparton. He came to Richmond, and blokes like KB had never heard of him. Well, nobody had heard of him. He, um, to start off, we realised we had to pull Richmond apart and um, one of the first things we had to do, a, a childhood hero of mine was the coach, uh, Des Rowe, and we had to ask Des to go and we got Len Smith. Now, Len Smith unfortunately had a heart attack, heart attack and um, uh, lived, but we appointed Tommy from Shepparton and Tommy took up the Len Smith rules of coaching, but added another dimension with physical fitness. Um, Kevin, somebody might like to argue this, but he, training was traditionally Tuesdays and Thursdays. No, he put in Wednesdays as well. <laughs> Plus the fact every player had to come down on Sunday morning for a light run or some skills training. And um, he got guys like Percy Sirity involved and we were by far the, far the fittest club. So added to the Len Smith was the added dimension of his unbelievable uh, oh, physical fitness of himself and the team. And, and this was pre-professional days, wasn't it? Blokes well, had yeah. daytime jobs. We all had to have jobs, yeah. yeah. And we, I think he was helped me admit this um, by taking up the Len Smith ritual, but also um, my late departed friend Graham Richmond brought some wonderful recruits to Richmond um, in the in the 60s. Did Graham go and headhunt Tom? Is he the one who found him? Yep. Um, he used to visit Tom when he was up looking for players in Shepparton. And, um, yeah, Graham was the one that um, convinced the committee and the president, Ray Dunn, that Tommy was the guy. Gee, he didn't let you down, did he? No. And yet, you were in the chair when he got the Evo. I thought you were going to bring this up, Drew. But, um, I was actually president and... Um, Without boring everyone, we had a vote. Two people dissented in 1976. Six. And, uh, but anyway, there was eight to two, and um, I rang up Tommy and said, you're reappointed for another year. But somebody still unknown to me, I'd like to find out who the bastard is, by the way, <laughs> um, obviously rang Tommy and told him it was, wasn't unanimous. Tommy came and saw me, came, uh, came and saw me in my office and said... Um, is it right that the vote wasn't unanimous? I said, oh, that's nothing. Don't worry about it. And he said, oh, come on, Octa. And I said, no, it wasn't unanimous. He said, is it true that Graham was one of the dissenters? And I said, yes. And he said, well, I'm resigning. And I said, look, look, do yourself a favour and me a favour. Think about it for 48 hours. And he once again came to my office and had a cup of tea and said, look, if I haven't got Graham's support, I'm resigning. And that was that. And, Gareth, the amazing thing was he went to Collingwood and was shown the door halfway through a season. He went to Geelong, got the sack there. He went to Sydney, did really well, got the sack there. What? He was a legend. What, uh, why did the axe keep falling? He was a terrible politician. <laughs> <laughs> like, Tommy was a great coach. He was a, he was a player's coach. The players loved him. And, uh, and 
you know, at Richmond back in the great days that uh, he had great support with Graham and Octa and uh, around him, and uh, but he didn't get that support at other clubs uh, for whatever reason. Um, Tommy was seemed to always be having infighting with his board, with the uh, with the executive. Uh, some of his great stories are his time in Geelong. Like he he just the moment Tommy started talking on the Geelong on Geelong, I knew I had another couple of cups of tea ahead of me, because he would because Maureen loved living down there. They loved living down there. They had a great house, a great lifestyle. But uh, if you heard Tommy talk about some of the what you what who, people who you would regard as great names in Geelong through that era, um, he just. Uh, he just couldn't handle it in the end and uh, went to the Swans and, of course, took a few of the best players from Geelong. And uh, apparently uh, Tommy and Maureen loved the Sydney lifestyle as well. They loved it up there. and he, he... They'd fit in anywhere, really. They, they were just a wonderful couple. Mm. And, you know, immediately, because they would just get themselves buried into the club itself with the players and the players' wives, the coaches' wives, they were into it. Probably the two blokes who publicly are the most... Um, with uh, with Tommy uh, and by your side, uh, Kevin Bartlett and Kevin Sheedy. Yeah. And Sheed spoke at the lunch yesterday at the yeah. MCG prior to that dismal game for the Tigers against Melbourne, Octa. You're all there to see it. And Terrible day. Anyway, this was Sheed's addressing the luncheon yesterday with all those premiership players there. There's only one Tom Hayden. Only one. Reflecting back in, in his life... I often wonder whether we sit there as players today and wonder where we would ever be without that man as individuals. I thought he was a super superhuman when I met him. I couldn't believe at 35 years of age, and I was 17, how powerful a person he was. Right at the stage where my own father, Thomas, had died. And I met this guy and his dedication and his inspiration was just magnificent. To pass on that energy to a young person who had never seen it before. I mean, most of us at 80 or 19 don't really know who we're going to be, let alone end up where we're going to end up. But he he shaped that for you. I don't know what he was like at school, but on attitude, he would get 100 on attitude. On enthusiasm, he would get 100. On health and fitness, he'd blow the whole college apart. He was just free in every aspect of probably he's not marked in education. His history of the game, his care and understanding of people is magnificent. We tend to forget that at times. He had a beautiful nature. His nature was that he would give time, his time for anybody. And that's why we appreciate the girls and Maureen in the time that you allowed it to happen. He was intimidating because he expected you to get the best out of yourself no matter what. And I had no idea what that was. Because you don't know. When you read out as a team, we probably felt, the boys, we felt that we were pretty much for There was not many times where we were going to get run over or smashed by the opposition. No doubt about that. We could be five or six, six goals down in the 73 preliminary final, and he expected us to win that game. And that's how you played for a coach. That's how you felt about this guy. He expected you to live, and he trained you that hard that he gave you the confidence to make sure you could carry on in the last 30 minutes of a two hour match. That's how good this guy was. He expected you not to be moved. But you lift your performance after being beat. That was Kevin Sheedy at the MCG yesterday, and we'll all be there again tomorrow. Kevin Morris, does it make you feel like running out and having a kick? It does, doesn't it? But uh, Tommy always did too. And I think you can't remove Maureen from the coaching 
aspect that success that Tommy had. I, I think um, Tommy believed before most others that women played an important part in the fabric of football behind the club and uh, with the players and coaches and I've got to say that um, he didn't distinguish between women, men, children. If he spoke to you, he looked you in the eyes and you couldn't talk bullshit to Tommy and you couldn't could bulldust on him. Uh, but Maureen was just fantastic around the club. Like The functions that we had down at their house um, were just fantastic with keeping the players together and it didn't matter whether we won or we lost. Um, you were looked after properly and the girls that belonged to the players, whether they be wives or, or friends, were certainly part of the fabric of the club. It sounds like nearly everybody who ever played for him has been down at his place and had a cup of tea in the lounge room. Now, Rhett Bartlett, who's the son of Kevin Bartlett, he's pretty much become the historian of the Richmond mm. Footy Club and uh, wrote the book and all that. And today we're privileged to be able to play parts of an interview that Rhett did with Tommy in the family home uh, from the Bartlett family collection. He did it on a little dictaphone and some never be heard, of, never be, never heard before snippets from... Tom, this is this one on life and football. Say you win the premiership in '67. When do you start to focus on '68? Uh, we would start training six weeks later, and that would be down at the Richmond ground. Uh, we would let the players go to gyms if they wanted to, because the weights we had down there weren't really adequate. But not only that, I thought that going away for somewhere else might have been better. And so if they wanted to go to the Oasis or to Finleys, and if anybody lived at Frankton. They could go and work at gym down there, but then we would have a uh, a period over Christmas time, maybe a fortnight where they didn't do anything. But they had to run a uh, hundred miles during January. Training started the first week in Feb, so they were expected to have done that on an honour system. If they, we would say, if they wanted to go to the gym, nearly, well, we felt that they should go to the gym. Might be the Golden Bowl down at. Uh, at um, Camwell, right. yeah, anywhere where they like to go, which is going to suit them to get away from the place. But then we bring them down first week, and then the first week of training, I can tell you what, the first week we train on the very first Monday of Feb. It might be the first or second or whatever. And they would do a time trial around the 10. On the Wednesday, no, that was on the Monday, because we train Monday, Wednesday, Friday uh, in the early part before the practice matches came along. The second night, we would do 10 440s against the clock, against the watch. And the third night, we would do 22 20s. So that was what our train, that what we did. For the first week, probably in nearly every year I was there, practically. You know what I mean? Geez, Gareth, no wonder they beat you in 67. You were the favourites at the catch. You had uh, all the stars down the spine and all that. And uh, against all odds, Richmond came out and beat you. Oh, yeah, that, that's... They really, uh, in 67, they sort of won one of when they shouldn't have because they just got this grip. You, you never say that. Polly, Polly, of course, still thinks that Geelong won um, but uh, or should have won. But uh, <laughs> Richmond were just a young, really young side with these players who were going to become champions. But uh, it was like the baby Tigers, wasn't it, Otter, mm, that yeah. uh, beat? We had a terrific side. It was Polly's last year at Geelong and uh, Sam Newman, Doug Wade. You know, they were a terrific side. And Marshall. Uh, Dennis Marshall, and then the other the other story of mine um, playing playing against uh, Richmond was 1969, the first semi final, when Geelong lost by a lazy 118 points, and uh, and I can always remember the by that stage Richmond had become arrogant. One of the great, most arrogant amongst them was Michael Green, and I always remind him of it when he was running back to the centre, and they were about 15 goals ahead. Michael's the nicest man alive, but he even he got that. Tiger arrogance about him, and that was all part of what Tommy. They just, they just wanted to win, and they just went on and smashed every side and won the premiership easily that year. Mm. Terrific sides. All good teams should have a touch of arrogance about it. Yeah. What about the Blues? They must have had a bit too. 
well, we certainly had arrogance, but um, I think hopefully Michael Green's got right of reply. Hopefully he's coming on later <laughs> because, uh, like, he's a wonderful guy, and uh, I know he held Tommy in high regard. But just on those on those issues of loyalty, um, we spoke about loyalty quite often in the box, and uh, Tommy was loyal to his players. And in particular, uh, you'd be part of this, Kevin. Players who came from other clubs were incredibly loyal to Tommy. They'd be loyal as the day is long. Uh, but the committee, uh, he could cop. Uh, he, he really couldn't cop loyalty from his players, but he really hated the uh, the administration that let him down if they were disloyal to him. And uh, I think he coined the phrase after that: "If you want loyalty, buy a dog." <laughs> <laughs> well, his his philosophy on life, again, touched in this uh, interview with Red Bartlett. Every day is a great day. You don't believe me? Try missing one. Yeah. So in other words, I, I say that all the time now, wherever I am, because really, like so many people, have got a grouch on the world got a terrible attitude and I just think that uh, unfortunately you're dead for a long time and so why don't you enjoy what you're doing like let's face it Greg you've seen it happen even at your young age you have so many people no matter what job they had they would bitch they could be old Mick Ferson's minder or in a girl's case could be Brad Pitt's minder and they'd bitch about the job and when I come to think of my life as a say working out there and about a job I didn't like and that just comes about because you're like people and you like working you got to be busy 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 like every job i've ever had and i did leave the printing trade from time to time i saw britney's lab was a great job and when i delivered papers i loved it delivered papers, delivered papers for about five years even when i started working i still go in deliver papers before i went to work and that was a great job i delivered green groceries uh because you used to ride the push bike on a saturday morning uh and you'd have the they had banana box on the, on the, on the, between the handlebars and taking the people's green glasses. We've got to do things to make dollars, sell the papers after school from time to time, stuff like that. And I always did two out of the three paper rounds, as I say, from around about, ooh, I would say 11 or 12, when I was 11 or 12, to the time that uh, I was even probably second year apprentice, 16, 17. Yes, sir. but then when, as I say, at a milk bar, I love the milk bar. Even though we work, oh, gosh, 12, 14 hours a day, seven days a week. Yeah, it was great. Met a lot of lovely people. I made a lot of friends. I was down in Bridge Road, Richmond. But uh, I, I think being very family is a big help. You've got a beautiful, loving family and very close. Oh, I think that's lovely. Anybody want to be El McPherson's minder? <laughs> <laughs> what a great way to put life. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> We've all deferred from answering about it. <laughs> Even though we probably all would like to be. Yeah. Partners might be listening. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Kevin Morris has fallen off his chair. <laughs> <laughs> now, Kevin, you went into the uh, publican game, didn't you? I did. And a few of these players did. I, it strikes me as being a bit of a... Uh, an anomaly that here he was the great teetotaler and a few of his blokes were not only drinking it but serving it. No doubt about that, but Tommy would come in weekly for a cup of tea and talk to all the patrons, etc., yeah. and mix with the people. It didn't bother him uh, from that viewpoint. We're talking about training on Sunday mornings. Uh, he decided to uh, let go some of the strings and offer Sunday mornings to the players and... I remember uh, the whale, uh, who was a publican, of course, and he set, set up the Sunday morning and we've jogged over to the tan and up the hill and we looked up to a con tenundra up the top and there were three levels of um, risers in the hill and there were cones at every one. He had a whistleblower at every one and we had to get up from the bottom, the tan track itself, to the top of the hill near the tenundra. And... Um, Tommy thought, God, how good is this? The whale has um, organised this fantastic 80-metre run through up the hills. We did about three of them. The third one, he blew a horn and he tapped the keg inside the Denundra and we all sat and drank <laughs> beers for the rest of the morning. <laughs> so uh, Tommy had to put up with that too. <laughs> now you say Michael Green should get the right of reply. He's on the phone. <laughs> Michael, good afternoon and welcome to ABC Grandstand. Thanks for having me, Drew. Uh, it was great to see you out there yesterday with the Premiership Cup in front of the members' stand. Um, look, it must have, must be a very emotional week that you've had. Yeah, I think it's been an emotional week for all of us. Even, even that uh, Carlton scandal you've got in there, David Mackay, I think even his stony heart may be uh, emotional about Tommy. 
Um, well, come yeah. on, you two, get stuck into each other. <laughs> Relive those days when you were running back to the centre 15 goals up. No, that no, was, that was yeah, that yeah, 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 don't look at Swan. <laughs> no, um, I, I, Gareth and I had one of those moments, which Gareth never lets me forget. Mm. Um, David Mackay, he actually defames me, and uh, but he says he's got proof of what he claims I did. I've never seen his proof, but he says he's got it. So uh, um, we've all had our, our times. But, Drew, this week, it's been a, I found it a strange week. Um, to some extent, it almost feels like Tommy hasn't died because we have seen so much and we've talked so much about Tommy there's been a real feeling of Tommy's presence still being with us. And I guess for all of us, we sort of relived the, you know, we've, I mean, even being on the field yesterday, um, it made me think about being on the field after the grand finals with Tommy there and, you know, people cheering Tommy, you know, carrying around on his shoulders, etc. So it, it's been a strange sort of week. Um, as I say, to some extent, it's almost as if Tommy is still with us. And you'll obviously be there tomorrow with thousands and thousands of others, I'd say. Yes, 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 yes. But, um, we all owe a debt to Tommy um, for the, his great selflessness uh, towards us, and therefore, yeah, I'll be there for sure, as will obviously Gareth will be there, Kevin will be there, Octa will be there. David, will you be there? Yes, I'll be there, Michael. Thank you, David. <laughs> Michael, uh, <laughs> talk to here, pal. Need some defence here. These fellas from other clubs, including Gareth, who really was sort of a tip over in 67 have accused us of being arrogant and that would be the last thing we'd be accused of, wouldn't it, Michael? I, Doctor, I couldn't agree more and anything that Gareth says about arrogant do not believe <laughs> because uh, Gareth's got some fiction in his mind that he seems to have uh, dreamt up and he will never let go of. No, we were a humble club, Doctor, which led by, your, led by your own humility, of course, and <laughs> that humility you've, you've displayed this very day, Doctor, so <laughs> how could we be any other than humble? Exactly. Carlton, of course, are a bit arrogant. David Mackay's loved jumping on my back and taking marks and telling me about it. So there's certainly more than a touch of arrogance in those Carlton sides. Well, all I can say is uh, let's hope you get some arrogance back into the Tigers because they oh, need it. Yes. Goodness gracious, uh, yeah, yesterday was uh, disappointing, wasn't it? And, uh, I mean, you can't sort of match events, you know, with the results. It can't be. It's not as easy as saying Tommy died and therefore we should win. But uh, all of us would have loved them to have had a win yesterday just so it would have sort of put the icing on the cake what was an emotional day remembering Tommy. But couldn't be, so... Uh, I guess we'll live in hope that it'll be better next week. Well, Michael, thanks for jumping on the phone and uh, being part of our little hour here about Tommy. Uh, really appreciate you and, and your right of reply. Appreciate it. Thank you very much, Drew. Michael Green, Premiership player with the Tigers. They had so many of them. Um, I was there yesterday just outside the President's Room and I did a few interviews with people on their way in. Now, you're talking about publicans and... Whale Roberts, he's probably one of the most famous publicans, they have an ale with the whale and all that. There he was. So I stuck a microphone underneath him and this is what he had to say. Brian Roberts, one of the most famous publicans in Melbourne. How did that go down with somebody like Tommy Hafey, who was such a teetotaler? Oh, shit, he burned down every pub in Victoria if he could. We just had to keep one jump ahead of him. Uh, he, he, he used to say, I know exactly what you're doing, I know what you're drinking. I said, yeah, you only think you do, if you're really new. But it was sort of, uh, we had to stay one step ahead of him, but he was fabulous, you know. Yeah. He, Would he uh, ring you on a Friday night to just oh, make yeah, sure yeah. you knew where you were? He'd ring home and I'd be uh, the phone and ring and Mrs. would say, oh, it's Tommy on the phone. I said, tell him I'm down the pub. That'll make him happy. <laughs> So were you able to sort of get away with a bit of individualism or was he just a disciplinarian? Oh, well, you, had, you know, I mean, look, it was very... Uh, he's very professional. He's probably the toughest coach of all times, really. Uh, so really, I suppose, you had to have a bit of light relief, otherwise you go bonkers. But I know he, I said to him afterwards uh, when he coached... Sydney and I said how'd you go coaching them? He said well, he said they wouldn't put up with it he said they wouldn't put up with it they wouldn't no, train nowhere near like we did I suppose that was because he was Richmond and, and you know but he was he was very I think we, I think Bergs will tell you we won most of the games we won because we were bloody frightened of losing because well I mean you imagine training under Tommy on a Tuesday night after he got walloped that's the last place you want to be. You know? So we just did our best to make sure that we won. But um, no, he's, he's had a big influence on a lot of us, you know, 
all of us. How'd you get away with ducking in and missing a lap of the tan and rejoining the group after they'd gone round? Well, I was like the boy that cried wolf. I could have got away with it, but I was so proud of myself doing it that I got home too early. When I got home too early, he said to Royce Hart, he said, Jesus, Royce, he said, what's bloody wrong with you? He said, even the whale's been you home. And Royce looked at me and he said, he said to me, he said, well, he hasn't passed me. So, uh, you know, I was caught out, but uh, I, used to, oh, I used to do it all the time. I couldn't handle all that tan track bullshit. And what was his tactic in the ruck? Did you palm it to three o'clock or...? Yeah, yeah well, you know, you look for... Obviously, you look for Kevin. It was Kevin would be there 99% of the time he's on the ball. And uh, you just try and get it down to him or flick it out the back. If he's out the back, you know, he might say out the back or I might say out the back and, you know, just walk it over or... But he's such a good rover, you know. He had the pace. I mean, if you did something, he could get there. You know what I mean? He wasn't one of those rovers that says... Well, he might get there. He'd get there, you know, because he had this pace. Well, sensational to see you. And uh, I know it's a sad week for everybody tied up with Tommy. Uh, good luck on Monday and good luck today with the dogs. Thanks very much for that. Well, Robert's just another one of those characters. Yep. Yeah, he was uh, he was a character and uh, viva la difference because... Uh, he was so different to Tommy, and they, you know, but Tommy still loved the whale because the whale handled it so well. And that comment about the drinking, and you know, whale was the, the soul of Richmond, and I really found it, that out when I went there. And uh, Octa, you were there when uh, the Tigers decided to let whale go. How did that happen? Because was that did Tommy um, was Tommy part of that play? Well, yeah, yeah, it was Francis Jackson, the whale, and. Graham T started won a Brownlow medal the next yeah. year. And, and that was certainly Tommy's decision. Yeah, yeah. I was president, but I didn't kick pick players out or pick them up. But yeah, yeah, certainly, yeah. Um, was certainly there when that, when that happened. Yeah. And, uh, just sometimes you can let the spirit of a club disappear if you if you clear these key blokes to in the in the spirit of what's going on. Even worse when the bloke that you recruited uh, didn't really turn out that well. I thanks very much, Swan. <laughs> Love that comment. I've said this publicly and privately. Um, it has to be me now because the other three people involved in getting Petura are all dead. It's Tommy, Graham and Alan Swab. But I, I've said publicly and privately, it's the biggest mistake that ever happened in my presidency and I regret it. But um, we went on and won a, won a couple more premierships after that. And um, But that was the largest mistake we made in, in my year at Richmond and I regret it today. The first VFL grand final I ever saw was 72. I was living in a state and there'd been a draw in the earlier part of the final series which put the season back a week, which allowed me to come from Perth to see it so it didn't clash with the WA grand final. Uh, 28 goals to 22, 50 goals between Carlton and Richmond in that grand final. Swan, you're on the winning side. It was amazing. 18 goals, six at half time. Well, it was just a shootout. And I think uh, I heard someone quoted during the week that Richmond scored their highest ever score on the MCG and was still beaten. So it was really just a shootout. Um, Nichols, uh, Jezelenko, Walls were all magnificent up, up our end of the ground. And um, I think Barn was uh, fairly uh, lethal down, the, down my end of the ground. In fact, he broke my jaw in the second quarter. So <laughs> I had to stay on. I wasn't very happy about it. In fact, uh, I kept asking Tommy about that. Was it he who sent Barm out or was it Graham Richmond? And now I'll never know. Any chance that Barmy just did it on his own, or was it under instruction? I don't think so. <laughs> <laughs> and actually, you made a mistake, because you gave Richmond the incentive the following year, and as everyone has said this week, Tommy was quoted as saying, there was no possible hope that Carlton could ever beat us in 73, because we had to get revenge for 72. Mm. What was it like, in that, in, say, leading up to the start of 73, or the eve of the grand final in 73, did you know you were just going to go out and win it? I think, Drew, it's fair to say that um, um, I was there as president in two losing grand finals. And, look, it's worse than coming last. I mean, I just can't uh, tell you the feelings, uh, particularly after 72 when, uh, when Carlton beat us. And we were just sort of desperados the following year. We just did everything possible and there was no known way we were going to be beaten. And um, it, it, it was sprung from this terrible, 
I don't know. Um, Kevin, you played in 72, didn't you? I did. And um, I don't know. It was just a feeling in the cl- All of us were just demented. It was just tragedy. And um, Kevin might be able to speak more about the playing side and the training side in 73, but within the whole club, we would just behave like desperados and we weren't going to be beaten. Now, 72 was really one that got away. We went in as <clears throat> short favourites, very short favourites. I think we'd won the second semi final by yeah. seven goals or so. And um, I don't think we went into games. There were some games you'd go in with an expectation that you were going to win them. Um, probably we had that expectation. I'm, I'm not so sure that we thought it was a game that we were going to win uh, by association because we kicked 22 goals, 1,850, which was equal to the highest ever score in a grand final, and we got beaten by 27 points, 28 goals, 9, 177. And that lived with us, and we carried the humiliation of that defeat into the next uh, 12 months. And when it came to that game, it became a game that we just were not going to lose not a game that we were going to win, but a game that we just were not going to lose, and uh, and we played played that way, I believe. True. They also then carried that forward into 1974. By the time you got there. By the time yeah. I got there, yeah. and I was there about the week after the Essendon and mm. um, the Windy Hill R, brawl. The Windy Hill mm-hmm. brawl, and uh, and I left Geelong as I said earlier one week, and I was in Richmond the next Saturday, and. I just couldn't believe where I'd come to. You know, just the, mm. the fact that I'd left Geelong, who were, you know, and, and I loved Geelong, and uh, they got got to the finals often. I got to a footy club, and, you know, where I met really met Tommy, and they just were there to win flags. They had no other ra- mm. raison d'etre. They had no other reason for being there but to win mm. flags, mm. did they, Octa? Mm. Yeah. And... Uh, and it was, it was, and particularly then, it was them against the world because mm-hmm. the whole of the Essen and Windy Hill brawl became an issue of, you know, the arrogant Tigers. And so it was Tigers against the rest. But also that year we played North Melbourne and they had never won a premiership before. And we got around to the southern stand and there were 90,000 people at the MCG booing us. Yeah. Mm. And the players were in a really tight-knit group and we all looked around and said, let's stick it up, these 90,000 people. <laughs> <laughs> you know? yeah. And it was. It was us against them because yeah. the crowd decided on the day that uh, they were barracking for the team and that's fair enough that we're going to win their first ever premiership but we didn't let that happen either. But there was a bit of a ruthless streak in Richmond from that uh, 1973 onwards. Even mm. Laurie Fowler when he got big nick early in the game and that certainly unsettled us. But Laurie Fowler wasn't a dirty player, it wasn't no. a dirty act. But obviously Tommy and uh, and everyone had been souped up so mm. much before the game that it, items like that that probably you know, don't look that serious but were really serious to us mm. really put us off our game and certainly yeah. helped you in that 73 victory. In 74, we'd heard before the game that Sam Kekovic was going to king hit somebody. Mm. And in those days, it was a diamond, not a uh, mm-hmm. square. Mm. And um, I was uh, on the opposite side of the uh, diamond to Francis on the halfback flank, and I heard a whack before the siren uh, started. And I looked around, and Francis was still... Ho- he was holding his jaw, but he had the other, other arm in front of uh, Sammy Kekovic, uh, not wanting him to go into the um, into the centre square as the game was about to start, so uh, Robbie McGee and I just went over to tell Sammy that uh, it's fine to be doing things like that, but now you've got to put your head down and then get the ball. So good luck with that today. Mm. And the game started after <laughs> discussion with the umpire and <laughs> finally started. And uh, I think there was a brawl later on in the game, yeah. but it might have been in the last quarter or the. Uh, it was incidental to anything else, and uh, we were pretty focused that day too. I did hear someone during the week say that Tommy's tactics were handball, long kick, start a blue. Handball, long kick, start a blue. Does that ring a bell with any of you? The great, the, re- the great Richmond story that I always heard was that Tommy's game plan, and it didn't change. And I don't know whether Tommy could have adapted to modern yeah. day football. He wouldn't have adapted to what he saw yesterday no. in that Richmond Melbourne game. That's for sure. But uh, get the mark, kick it long to Royce. And get and, out of his way. And, and everyone to get out of his yeah. way. 
and uh, put your arm up high the last weekend in uh, September carrying the cup. That was so it goes on a bit further than kicking it to Royce, but yeah. uh, Royce was the key. Yeah. yeah. Well, here's Tommy again in his lounge room chat on the importance of football in our society. You learn so much about football, and I even say now, hey, look, there's no race colour creed in football nipple club. There's no room for the rich or room for poor in football nipple club. Doesn't matter what school you went to, what car you drive, or how big a house you live in. When you get down to the ground, everybody is an equal. Hey, the camaraderie, the respect, and the getting to know the life disciplines where you might be only a youngster to older folk, to parents, to grandparents, and there's history and tradition that you come from football club. It's just so special. And I don't think people understand that. And I've just finished reading Polly Farmer's book, and he said, even though he has a boy from an orphanage, and he loved the orphanage, actually, he said, when I got down to football club, it was like the home I never had. Isn't that a lovely way of putting it? Isn't that a lovely way of putting it? I really, really love it. I mentioned it today. I've been around taking Sacred Heart Mission for footy training down around Lorek Lorek Link. And I said exactly that because I know how a lot of those folk underprivileged and maybe handicapped, physically and mentally handicapped in a lot of cases. And I just mentioned that because I know how they love to cross the white line in the same colours as each other. And I've been to some of those places when they're receiving their trophies, and the boys broke down and cried because he's got the best clubman. He said, I went down and played my first game at 35, and people were calling me by my name. I couldn't believe it. Yeah, isn't that loving? Eh? Hey? People don't understand how important football is, particularly the community. As you know, that's what I do now. I go all over the place. A bit disappointing that they don't get the, enough credit and enough help from a lot of people. Governments cancel AFL. Disaster. Yeah, give nothing. Talk up what they do. Don't give anywhere near enough. I keep on saying, if, hey, if football was to be, say, cut out because of insurance problems, we would be building second and third stories on every jail in Australia. You realise that? That's how important it is. Isn't it great to hear those words yeah. from Tommy Hafey? We're yeah. having a wake for Tommy here today with uh, Octa Wilson, former president of the Tigers, Gareth Andrews, Kevin Morris and David Swan Mackay. Um... I reckon you're, you're all chilled listening to him talking like yeah, that. Yeah, yeah. And it's so true. Mm. Simple. I mean, there's simple uh, words that... Uh, and, and Tommy wasn't complicated. He was never complicated. He just spelled out with, in words that everybody could understand, Drew. Octa, one, yeah. of, the, one of my favourite days of footy, I started broadcasting the VFL in 1977 and about round four it was Anzac Day and yeah. Richmond played Collingwood and yep. Tommy was coaching in Guinea for yep. the first time. 92,000 people turned exactly. up. Exactly. What a day that was. Yep. Except we got beaten, so it was a hell of a day, about day for me. Well, he was a good coach, Tom. Well... <laughs> why do you bring these things up, Drew? I was having a happy time since you brought that up. But it was... Um, Tommy did fantastic things for um, Collingwood, where they were, I think they last, and he got them to the grand final in one year. Um, but uh, that was a fairly miserable day, that Anzac Day. I think Barry Richardson was our coach at the time. And um, can we move on, move on to something else? Yeah, we'll, we'll do that. <laughs> Yesterday, when I was lurking outside the president's room, uh, I did have a chance to bump into KB. Now, he's busy today. He couldn't come into the studio with us today, but I did have a little bit of a chat to him, and here he was yesterday. Kevin Bartlett, it must have been a very tough week for you this week. Well, I think it's been a tough week for a lot of people, Drew, because you know, Tommy was such a, a loved person, particularly you know, with uh, Richmond and the Golden Era and all the players and... You know, the players having so much to do with Tommy over those years as well because, you know, Tommy's always kept in such close contact with all the players and, you know, each Christmas uh, he always has the big get-together with all the players. So it's, uh, it's been a sad week for everyone. So through all those years from the 60s onwards, they've kept in touch at Tommy's uh, lunches and reunions? Well, he, made, he, he always made certain of that because, you know, he'd always organise, uh, you know, get-togethers and things of that, that nature and he, and he was always ringing up people as well and... You know, make certain if you've spoken to so-and-so lately, if you haven't, you know, give him a call. And I saw so-and-so recently, I got a phone number off him, you know, so give him a buzz. So Tommy was always very keen to try and keep everyone together. He didn't have to ring you on a Friday night to make sure you were home? Oh, yes. <laughs> he, rang, 
He rang everyone on a Friday night, but some of them weren't home. Were you, you, you would just hope, Drew, that you'd be one of the first he'd call, yeah. because otherwise you might get a call at half past 11 or quarter to 12, because you might be the last one on the list. So many a time you had to get out of bed to answer the phone in those days. And, uh, and talk to Tommy for about, you know, 20, 25 minutes, you know. So uh, if you got the call early, it was much better. So was it talking tactics about the game or just how you're feeling? Um... Well, generally it was, uh, it was a bit of a, a, bit of a rev up. Uh, you know, you'd say, oh, look, it's, we've got a big game and, you know, you can play an important role today. And, you know, if everyone does this and does that, you know, uh, you know last time we, we did so well against him. He was always trying to be positive, Tommy, uh, in terms of, uh, you know, playing, playing against an opposition or your role you had to play. And he'd relate back to other occasions when you may have played against that particular opponent or that side and, and you'd done well. So it was, it was always, uh, he wanted to leave a positive message uh, before you got to the ground. Now, you kept on being best and fairest in those premiership years. They talk about clear the forward line, kick it to Royce and get out of the way. Surely he was saying, just get it to KB. <laughs> no, no that's our, that was our tactics. Tommy, Tommy uh, you know, liked the idea. He was a great devotee of, uh, of Norm Smith. He loved Norm Smith and uh, he based his coaching around Norm Smith and the great Melbourne sides, you know, with big Bob Johnson in the forward line and, and uh, get the ball and kick the ball long. T -t -t a lot of people think sometimes just... You know, it wasn't haphazard. You had to kick the ball long to an advantage and then players in between run up hard, you know, compete very strongly for the ball. And if they had the opposition, had it, well, chase and tackle. Pretty much the same things that they actually do today. But he was always keen on you kicking to the longest option rather than the shortest option. And his teams kick big scores. They kick big massive scores. scores. I mean, the Swans kick over 30 goals yeah. three weeks in a row when he was coaching. That is correct. That is correct. Uh, and you had uh, Sydney absolutely jumping. That was one of... I mean, Tommy... Uh, was very strong on, you know, tackling and chasing and harassing, but... No, tackling, chasing, <laughs> harassing. That's right. Sometimes the G went, went missing, <laughs> but, you know, the message was strong. And the idea was, of course, uh, to score at the same time. He, he liked scoring, and even when we lost the grand final of the Carlton here, there was 50 goals scored in the grand final because, you know, as long as you're in front on the scoreboard when the siren goes, but Tommy played a very entertaining brand of football. He coached an entertaining brand of football. You know, he did all the things that they talk about today, but he, he probably coached a, a style of game that I'd like to see the modern game play it, and that is kicking more goals rather than see seven goals and eight goals. And who comes away, you know, getting excited about a great rolling war for 75 minutes? KB, you're exactly right. Good on you, mate. Good on you, Drew. Kevin Bartlett, uh, yesterday, prior to the game, he would have been as disappointed to see what happened as uh, most of your Tigers blokes would have been. There's another legendary Tiger who's got on the phone. He's had to go back home to Nathalia during the weekend after yesterday's game. And he's on the phone. Francis Burke, welcome. Uh, good day, Drew. How are you doing? Excellent. Were you part of the world's greatest centre line or were you a centre-half back or full back? They moved you back into a key defence after playing on the wing. Well, I, I suspect I was pretty ordinary, but sort of grew better as I grew older and retired longer, Drew. I think you might be underselling yourself. Uh, well, yeah, well, I mean, look, that's one of the things, I suppose, that comes as a consequence of winning games and winning finals, of course. Um, you do get caught up in the, the romanticism, I suppose, of winning, and uh, you tend to uh, overlook uh, the faults and the weaknesses, of course, but... Uh, uh, but one thing about Tommy Hafey, I mean, it was he who started all this promotional stuff about Burke, Barrett and Clay and uh, uh, the uh, invincibility, the so-called invincibility of the Tigers and the ruthlessness. And, but Tommy promoted these players and myself and others, of course, uh, relentlessly. And uh, in the end, I just felt sometimes, which was, I guess was to our benefit, but uh, it just, uh, as I said, it tended to uh, put portray the image a bit greater than what it actually was because we did actually lose a game here and there and occasionally we did drop uh, our battles with our individual opponents but but as I said with the passing of time uh, Tommy just sort of um, forgot about all that. Was he a match day coach or was most of the work done uh, leading up to the game because uh, my memory of him was that uh, if the bloke was getting beaten he, he was very reluctant to shift him. Well, that's true. 
and uh, I think that uh, he was both a during the week coach and a match day coach. But the difference between uh, him and now, whereas I mean, if you, if your opposition seems to you know get an extra possession or an extra kick on you early in the game, before you know it, you're on the bench or you're a different position. But Tommy always gave his players the opportunity to fight back, and that was part of his mantra uh, to just do that. The battle wasn't decided. In the opening salvo, it was always decided over the course of the game. And, uh, I mean, look, who will ever forget him moving Billy Barrett in the, after Billy lowered his cover, colours to Ian Robertson in a, uh, a cut straight game at Princess Park and moving him to full forward onto Wes Loft. And Billy then almost, um, you know, out of the blue, kicking eight goals, I think it was. Well, uh, Swan Mackay's here listening to you and he's yeah. nodding. <laughs> Yes, I, so, I thought it was I mean, six, but Kevin thought it was seven. And, uh, well, it was, it was, well, it might have been 12 if Tommy had. <laughs> but, uh, but it's just, that, I mean, that was a, a, a master stroke, and, and uh, uh, people tend to forget that, you know. But, uh, but overall, I mean, he trained us uh, for Saturday during the week as well. And, uh, you know, and, and to be fair, I mean, we all loved Tommy, and he was a fatherly figure, and benign and uh, humorous and that, but if we dropped the game, well, this was a different Tommy Hafey that we had to confront in the early part of the week, for sure, you know, and particularly when he used to stand in the middle of Punt Road with his whistle uh, tied to his finger around his neck and calling out for more contesting and, and more chase and more run and more Indian file at 20 past seven of a, of a Tuesday night, you know, and so, but what he was really doing, of course, was asking uh, more of us to, in, in, uh, lifting, to lift our game and to do better and because he was doing it and he was calling for all this, the players somehow knew that this price that they had to pay uh, was worthwhile and therefore was done you know, with reasonable grace, I should say. Francis, thank you very much for pulling over on the side of the freeway and giving us your <laughs> contribution. You are part of the legend that uh, was that era under Tommy Hafey at the Tigers. Francis Burke. Yeah, thanks very much, Drew. And I was very fortunate that my time at Richmond uh, w uh, coincided with Tommy's, and I think all the players would feel that way also. Good on you, Francis. And just sitting in the studio watching heads nod and uh, mm. what people, various people have said about Tom, yeah. you all agree that uh, he was just a remarkable bloke. He was, inspired and, you all. Uh, Drew, it was interesting that uh, Kevin talked about Maureen and uh, my brother-in-law, Jeremy, married Rhonda Hafey. So Tommy's first two grandsons were my nephews. And, you know, I saw Tommy the family man, and he was amazing with those yeah. two grandsons. They, he just treated them like his own boys. And yeah. he'd had the three daughters who he loves and dearly, and we saw them year yesterday. But Tommy was a great family man uh, above everything else. Absolutely above everything else. Gareth, thank you very much for coming in and uh, reliving your moments under Tom in that one premiership year. Octa Wilson, you get sick and tired of saying that uh, uh, that uh, Carolyn Wilson, she's the most famous in the family these days. She's taken over, multimedia, all that. She keeps telling me that. Oh, does she? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Thanks for coming in and being part of this. And Kevin Morris, both at Richmond and at Collingwood under Tom, uh, must have been great years for you. And thanks right. for sharing the memories. Thank you, Drew. And Swan, great to see you back in ABC studio. You've spent many, a many year here and round the grounds with Tom. And thanks to the ABC for uh, pairing us together. They were the best football days of my life, watching football, and uh, doing it with Tommy was just an absolute pleasure. It really was. Um, I suppose, you, you know, you do a report sort of three times a quarter, and in between you're just chatting about life and footy, and so... It was, and that was, uh, that was really the highlight of the day. As I said, uh, to be in the best place of the, in the house... And to be able to chat, uh, talk football with Tommy all afternoon was just something, something special, sensational. Thank Drew, you very I much think for also being that, involved. That uh, Ian hosts uh, premiership players at Richmond of a Wednesday night before the grand final every year mm -hmm. that Tommy has been to, and uh, all the premiership players get uh, get there, and it's just a fantastic continuance of the family feeling that uh, we have within our club, and it's a credit to Ian that he does that for the players. Beautiful. Thank you, lads. Love it. So, Vale, Tommy Hafey, and the funeral is at the MCG tomorrow. Coming up next, football retrospective and the Crows' first game in the AFL against Hawthorne in 1991. 
We were all there at the MCG yesterday. It was moving. I'd rather have a, a minute's applause than a minute's silence. And that's what we got. And yeah. a crowd of over 50,000 was there to say farewell, Tom.